it? It's about warriors and battles that grab our attention. Battles in the Bible are legendary. When David fought, come on, I said they're legendary. Goliath. <laughs> when Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. See now you think. When Samson fought the Philistines. Ooh, very good. When Gideon fought the yes. incredible. See battles and warriors. They grab us. They get our attention. The blood and guts of the Old Testament highlights the reason I call the Old Testament the bad news. Okay? Because we know the New Testament is the what? What's the bad news? The bad news is this. If you're not Jewish, get out of the way. Okay? Because the Old Testament is about God's people moving forcefully through history. And in fact, those battles were fought, won, and lost to prepare God's people to deliver a savior to the world. A man who would win a war against the very source of evil in our world. But Jesus fought this war with a different kind of weapon. In fact, weapons that were more potent and powerful than ever imagined by God's people before in the Old Testament. And it had a devastating effect on the devil and his evil or in fact, it's legendary, those weapons that Jesus used. But in contrast to the Old Testament's tactics of kill, destroy, and plunder, if you read the New Testament, the New Testament's invading armies did something very different. They healed people. They saved lives. They shared and sacrificed with each other and for each other. Now, friends, and we're still in the intro, so stay with me. There was a man caught in the very hinge of the Old Testament and the New Testament. He was at the pivot point of the New Testament and the Old Testament. He spent half of his life in the Old Testament, and then the other half of his life in the New Testament. This man's name was Paul. You see, he was utterly conquered by the good news and then proceeded to write about a third of the New Testament. Now, he wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the text that we will look at for the next several weeks. He was a man who previously followed the Old Testament path of dealing with enemies. The Old Testament path how do you deal with enemies? You kill them quickly and in mass. In fact, he was on his way to do that when he met Jesus. He encountered the New Testament tactic that to this very day horrifies the devil himself and sends demons screaming into the night. You see, Jesus never kills anyone because his mission is to seek and to save. Jesus does not kill his enemy. He converts him. But killing is so much more glamorous, so much easier, and so much more affordable. Anyone can arm themselves to the teeth, proclaim their desire for self-preservation, and forget about the needs of the world. But that's not the way true love, true power, and lasting peace, or even God's purpose, is achieved. The old way has passed, and the new way is here. And Jesus is looking for a few good men and women to take up the battle and become the spiritual soldiers that are needed to fight this war. And so this fresh convert, the Apostle Paul himself, gives us what I call our textual target for our Bibles. So let's hit it. You'll see... I finally got to your outline. You'll see under Believer's Battle, Ephesians 6, 10 to 13. The textual target. Every spiritual soldier needs four mental essentials before they armor up. This is the intro to our series on the armor of God. This is the mental preparedness, the things that you need to put on before you put on that. 
you need to put on this. And so we're going to talk about four mental essentials, things that you need to have in your head before you armor up. Now, if you haven't already opened your Bibles to Ephesians, uh, I would invite you to do that now. Bye. Ephesians is a little bitty book towards the back of your Bible. If you look, you can find it. If you forgot your Bible at home because you thought it was going to rain and you didn't want to get it wet, don't worry. There should be a Bible hiding at the ends of your pews. It's there for you to use. If you have a Bible you can read or understand, take that home as a late Christmas gift. We'd love it when people can read the Word of God together. And so, Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to start in verse 10. And that's where you'll find the first mental essential. Did you get there yet? Yes, sir. Okay. Verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Now, I'm going to be straight with you. I kind of messed up the outline. So if you want to write in a little bit, I just I gave this sermon to the Sermon Review Committee. It was my wife. And she was like, that... You gotta, you gotta fix that. So here it comes. Um, God is our strength. I believe you have our strength in there. God is our strength. How many of you remember the army slogan of the AIDS? Do you remember it? B. Goodness. Somebody tell me advertising doesn't affect you. That was the AIDS. We got people that weren't even born when that was out. Be all you can be. Even today's army of one slogan contrasts sharply with God's warrior whose strength is not found in self, but rather in God. In the American military, if you have a serious physical weakness, you can be rejected. I have a good friend uh, from high school. He wanted to be a Navy flyer. He, that was from, from early on, he went, you remember Top Gun? He went and got the jacket. I mean, he, that's all he wanted to do. He was talking to his Navy recruiters when he was like 15. Uh, getting signed up, getting in, got in, checked his eyes, you're not flying. Okay? Because his strength wasn't enough. Now, once you're in, they do do all they can do to build you up physically, to make you strong. But then if you are injured or broken or become sick or weak, you, you can be discharged. Because in the military, in the worldly wars, your strength is incredibly important. In fact, it's essential. But when we think about God's warrior. It's in that first verse. God is our strength. God often uses the weak and the small to show His power. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, 10, a mystifying verse. When I am weak, then I am strong. Think about that. When I am weak, then I am strong. The classic example of this, we've already shouted a little bit. David. Youngest in the family, small God by what we believe, faced Goliath. Saul offered him the armor. He said, no, I don't want it. Didn't take it. Went in God's power to fight Goliath and won. Christian, the difference between you and David is now God is saying, Leave your sling and your stones at home. Go full on my power, on my strength, and see what happens. Application. Whose strength and power are you trusting in today? If I can look at the big picture. We, we have an incredible disadvantage in regards to relying on God's strength. We live in what is still one of the richest and most powerful military uh, nations the world has ever known. But what if we weren't? 
what if our debt finally catches up with us? And it will. What if we would be crippled militarily? Where would our strength be then? Is your ultimate trust in God or country? I hope it's in God. What about you personally? Perhaps you sit here relatively young and healthy. You see yourself as a strong person, perhaps even powerful. Does the scale of gratitude to God tempt to an attitude of pride or arrogance? And we forget that God alone gives us all the strength and health that we have. Have you humbly acknowledged He is the source and relied on Him for everything, thankfully? The mental essential that you must have before you try to put on the armor of God is that God is your strength. So what's the next mental essential? Verse 11. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Here again, I'm sorry I messed up. The scheme is deadly. The scheme is deadly. That's what you need to add to the armor. Did you know, uh, you'll see it on, on those tracks sometime, uh, God has a plan for your life. Did you know the devil has a plan for your life? Uh, a while back I wrote a crosswinds about how the devil has a plan for your dating life. He does. But he has, a, he has a plan for your life in general as well. There's a plan A and a plan B. These are the schemes that Paul is talking about. What's the scheme? Plan A is to kill you. And I'm not just talking in a spiritual sense. I'm talking to physically kill you. It's imperative that you remember all the time the devil wants you dead in a way that is not God glorifying or God honoring. He just wants you dead. Abortion has done an incredible job of this. Over a million every year. Suicide is another part of that plan. Over 38,000 a year. Suicide. That's shocking. But it's true. Because the devil's scheme, plan A, is to get you dead. Now, why would that be? Because if you're dead, you can't fight him. You can't follow Christ and call other people to follow Christ because you're dead. And he wants to kill you. Make no mistake. But if he can't kill you, there's always plan B. And that is to wound you. Sexual abuse. Divorce, gossip, lying. The devil's schemes to wound you are extensive and devastating. And if he can get you wounded in the context of the church, that is especially effective. If the devil can get you wounded in church, it's almost as good as killing you. Words the devil loves to hear more than almost any other. I will never go back to that church. The one he likes almost as much is, did you hear what that pastor did? Those are words the devil loves to hear. Application. How have you seen devil the devil's plan A go into effect? In your life, the lives of people around you? Have you ever considered suicide? I remember a very dark time in my life. I was around age 15. That I, I thought about it. I considered it. But I thank God for a loving family, a loving youth pastor, and to, to be totally honest, an art teacher and a, a school counselor from Downton High School that walked with me and, and saved my life. How else have you seen lives snuffed out before their time? How have you seen Plan B 
affect you? Have you been wounded? Have you been healed or are you still bleeding? Do you have God's armor on you? Or do you still feel vulnerable? And as we move in to God's armor, there's a wonderful healing effect that that armor can also have in your life. That's incredible. And that armor can help heal those wounds and keep other wounds from happening. That's why we need it. But friends, you need to understand, you need to have the mental essential that the devil's scheme is deadly. The next mental essential, we're halfway done. Verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. On your messed up outline, our struggle is with Satan. Our struggle is with Satan. In our sophisticated culture of post-enlightenment, where we believe science always trumps the supernatural. In fact, we mock the spiritual when I see angels portrayed as naked, fat little babies flying around. It's, it's offensive to me. When I see demons portrayed in little red suits with horns and tails, we've been duped. We don't believe the power of the evil spiritual realm, and so we don't engage in fighting through worship and prayer and through the word. In fact, many times we take our sights off of our true enemies as listed, as listed. We take our sights off of our true enemies and we track them on to each other. In the military, it's called friendly fire. When you shoot people who are on your side. In the church, we call it splits and schisms. The devil is an expert at camouflage, and he can make your brother or sister in Christ look like the enemy. He can make your spouse or your child look like the enemy, but they're not. One of the most powerful things, in fact, it's worth the price of admission to go to the weekend to remember. Uh, that's a marriage seminar that's coming up in March this time. It is worth the price of admission for one thing that they do at that seminar because it's so amazing. At a certain point in the seminar, they have everyone stand up. The husbands and the wives stand up. And you need to understand that there are husbands and wives that are on the verge. I actually worked one of the tables there registering people. And they were on the verge. They said, this is it. And they sit together, you know, on this side of the seat, because the other, there's a point in that weekend where the presenters have you stand up, look in each other's eyes, and say, you are not my enemy. They don't point. I'm sorry. People fall out. People start to cry. Because you are not my enemy. It's incredible. Application. Have you confused your enemy? Or have you been a victim of friendly fire? Can you commit to engaging in the spiritual battle every day with devotions, with prayers at meal and at bedtime every week here at the worship opportunities that we have. 8.45, you come and start praying. 9.30, you could be in a Sunday school class. 10.30, you're right here. And usually, sometimes, not today, but at 11.30 or whenever we get done, there's more time to pray. Will you engage in that? The mental essential you need to put on is our struggle is with Satan. Our struggle is with sin. Last one. Verse 13. Therefore put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, 
you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand. You see, in the scripture it says stand twice. So I just thought I'd make it vivid to you. Okay? This is you with no armor. Did you get that? <laughs> this is you. Dead. Okay? Now, this is you with half the armor. Okay? This is you kind of coming half the time. This is you engaging a little bit. This is you. Wounded. Okay? This is you with the armor. This is what Jesus wants. This is what I want. Oh, this is what you want. To stand. Why do we need the armor? The stand is possible. That's your mental essential. The stand is possible. Because what is coming? What is coming? The day of evil. I want you to look very, very closely at your Bible. I want you to know, does it say, if the day of evil comes? It says, when the day of evil comes. You may sit there and say, oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. Everything's great in my life. Really? If it is, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But it's coming. The day of evil is coming. A cancer diagnosis. A car accident. A chance to lie, to lust, or to steal. Evil will rush into your life like a bullet. And I hope you, I hope you have the armor on so that you can stand. Application. And this is where it is true. Have you chosen a side to stand on? The war is on. The enemy is attacking constantly. And if you're not on the side of Jesus, and you're not taking up his armor, you have no hope for survival. You will end up standing on the wrong side. Let me give you the sermon in 20 seconds. Your strength isn't enough against the deadly schemes that are planned for you. Your struggle is against Satan himself and his evil minions. And a day is coming when the attack will come. Where will you be standing? You can stand if you have Jesus and his armor. But the first thing you need to do is choose a side. Are you on Jesus' side or not? You may say, oh no, 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 I'm neutral. I'm like Switzerland. There is no Switzerland in the spiritual war. You know what Oscar Meyer says. That's B-O-L-O-G-N-A. There's no in-between. Which side are you on? In this battle, there will be only victors or victims. The victors are those who believe for Jesus today and for eternity. And those victims are those who die without him. So how do you join Jesus' original Salvation Army? You don't need to stand there with a bell in a red bucket. The original Salvation Army is really quite simple to join, but it's not easy. Simple as ABC, and you've heard it a million times, but I'm going to tell you again. Admit that you're a sinner and that you need a Savior. Turn away from your sin. Wake up, sober up, get out of the devil's scheme. How do you get out of the devil's scheme? You confess your sin and then you repent. You turn around and you move away from that scheme that was entangling you. You repent of the sin that wants to kill you. B, believe Jesus is who he said he is in the Bible, the Savior who lived a perfect life, died an atoning death, and then was raised to life. To prove that the resurrection is real. And then commit. See. Commit your life to doing what he commands. And following him through life and death. Moving from victim to victor today. Let us pray. 
O oh Lord, you have blessed us in so many ways. You have given us so much to be thankful for. And we praise you for scripture and for the witness of Christians throughout history that have proven to us indeed that there is a battle going on. It's life and death, it's heaven and hell. And so we ask today that you would move deeply in our hearts and in our minds and ultimately in our souls that we can understand which side we're on and oh Lord if we're on the wrong side to get right. Oh Lord that your spirit would move among us today and that someone would come to know you and become a victor. In Jesus' name, amen.